Hey, Canteeners. Welcome back to the next episode of Culper's Canteen Cup. Thanks for Carlton Zeus uh, for that intro music. That's Alpha Child. Check him out. You know where. You know where. So, yeah, today we've got uh, no script, no show prep, no edit, no Roger, no problem. But uh, as you all know, there's a uh, there's a lot going on right now, specifically in Afghanistan. We've been talking about that a lot lately. And, you know, the three of us have a lot going on. And Roger, unfortunately, can't record with us today because of some family commitments. And we understand. So it's just going to be me and Josh. And we're going to try to get this out as soon as possible so that y'all can listen to it on your on your way to work tomorrow. But maybe give us some thoughts on uh, Instagram, Twitter or uh, or Facebook. So we're just going to, like I said, no script, no show prep. Uh, Josh and I just, and, and Roger also felt it was a good idea to, to get this out and talk about it because it's a historic event. It, it really is. What's going on right now, which I'll let Josh kind of describe in his way, is, is historic. I mean, this is, uh, like Josh said a couple episodes ago, that last uh, Soviet general crossing over the Friendship Bridge. You know, it's that moment. It's the Saigon moment. Um, despite what the administration wants to say. So I'll, I'll, without further ado, I'll kick it to Josh. And again, uh, just bear with us because there's going to be very little edit and you'll be able to tell a difference because uh, our editor, sound editor does a really good job. So Josh, take it away. <laughs> hey, yeah, so everybody knows what's going on in Afghanistan right now, unless you're living under a rock. Um, so currently, as the situation has it right now, we have a unknown number of Americans. I've seen a couple of numbers. It's probably three to four hundred that are at Kabul International Airport uh, right now, sitting on the tarmac, trying to uh, trying to get evacuated out of Kabul. Uh, right now, the Taliban. Uh, have control of Kabul. They have taken control of the presidential palace and the majority of the city. Uh, There are some reports of rockets and mortars uh, impacting in and around Kabul International Airport. Um, The president of Afghanistan, Ghani, well, I should say the former president now, he resigned and he has fled Afghanistan with some members of his cabinet, supposedly moving into uh, Tajikistan. So what we just what we witnessed over the last I I mean, you really you could go back and say it's over the last, you know, however many years of the Taliban slowly taking back control of, you know, sections of Afghanistan. But what we've seen in the last probably 96 hours is unprecedented. We didn't even ISIS didn't even take northern Syria or northern Iraq this quick. Uh, The Taliban, you know, we talked about this a couple episodes ago. We talked about. You know how long it was going to take for the Taliban to take Afghanistan, even though Joe Biden said it was not inevitable, even though the intelligence community said it would take a year, year and a half for the Taliban to take over, you know, take back Afghanistan. Being that the most of, you know, all three of us have, uh, we've seen this before, we've lived it, uh, you know, up close and personal. We knew that it wasn't going to take that long at, at all. And so they basically, you know, they've taken Kabul in less than 96 hours. Uh, which is absolutely insane. Uh, so right now we have not heard from the president of the United States. Joe Biden has not released a statement. Uh, the White House tweeted, or I got correction, CNN tweeted uh, approximately 50 so minutes ago that the president would come out and address the nation, quote, in a few days. So let's put that in perspective for you. Right now, you have an active non-combatant evacuation operation going on with hundreds of Americans. Right now, they are not able to get airplanes out of Kabul uh, due to the large number of Afghanis um, and other folks who have swarmed the airport and are blocking the runway, trying to get on planes, trying to get on anything smoking out of Afghanistan. So right now, planes can't take off as about that was about about 50 minutes ago, maybe an hour ago. Uh, so you have, you know, a couple hundred Americans plus troops, you know, at Kabul International Airport that cannot get out. Uh, and the president of the United States is going to address the nation in a few days. Um, you know, this thing is going to be over in a few hours, uh, you know, so in a few days, it's not not really going to matter. But, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of emotions on it, uh, a lot of mixed emotions on this. Uh, as with a lot of folks who, you know, who have served over there. Um, all I can tell you is that elections have consequences. Uh, you know, that's uh, elections have consequences. So, you know, the next time you, you know, you, you, 
you go to the poll and you cast your vote, are you casting it based on logic or are you casting it based on emotion? Uh, a lot of folks cast them based on emotion and you have what you have. Uh, Joe Biden is currently at Camp David. Uh, he went on vacation after the NEO started, uh, something that he lamented President Trump for, you know, numerous times. Um, you know, even though not once during the four year presidency of uh, President Trump did we ever have a NEO, we never evacuated an embassy. Um, and you know, Luke, uh, you know, we're talking about this, and you go back to Saigon and the pictures of you know, Huey's lifting folks off the top of the, you know, the, the roof of the embassy. Um, Joe Biden was a senator, Joe Biden was a senator during the fall of Saigon, Joe Biden was vice president. During Benghazi, where Stevens and three others were, at, you know, Ambassador Stevens and three others were killed, and now Joe Biden is the president in in this debacle. So I, you know, I'm not sure how many more uh, how many more lessons we need to go through with Joe Biden. So, um, turn it back over to you. Kind of get some of your feelings on uh, on, on what's going on. Uh, yeah, maybe some, maybe some feelings, and I'm sure as we as we uh, kick it back and forth, we'll come up with different stuff that has come up in the news today that maybe uh, not everybody in our audience has seen or had the time to look at because it, it is, after all, a Sunday and people got other stuff to do. But like I said, it is it is fairly it's not fairly historic; it is historic. Yeah, I went to bed last night uh, pretty late, uh, driving back from Oklahoma City. Shout out to Scott. Um, I went to bed about three in the morning uh, Central Time. Uh, with the fall of Jalalabad, and I, I kicked that out to the guys, and I was like, "Oh man, J Bed, that's ge- geographically it's close, but um, yeah, it's even closer than than the com- kilometers reflect." And I woke up to Ghani has uh, fled to Af- to Tajikistan, and uh, the Taliban is uh, pretty soon going to announce that there's that they are now the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. You know, we were going to, you know, be cute and maybe call this show This Ain't Saigon or Don't Call It a Neo, but uh, I should have said this right up front. This this show is simply called The Fall of Kabul, and uh, I got to give Josh some real props because that, that episode he he talked, you know, we, we spoke about, we spoke about uh, two ago, I believe, where it was just Josh and I again. Man, he called. I, I listened to that episode again on the way back from uh, Oklahoma City last night. And man, I mean, Josh, you you were just spot on. I mean, I was way off. I, I really thought that uh, I, I gave the Biden administration too much credit. I gave the DOD military planners and the commanders on the ground too much credit, thinking that they would slow roll the pullout and the Taliban would wait out the winter until they took Kabul. And obviously that did not happen. I am absolutely outraged uh that the president of the United States is on vacation right now. As Josh said at Camp David, there's the picture going around of him sitting in the whatever situation room at Camp David. No one is in there with him. He's on a zoom or Skype or MS teams, whatever call with the NSC and talking about what I I don't know. But I think what outrages me about that, and I, you know, I don't, we talk about our feelings a lot here on Culper's canteen cup, uh, probably too much. So, but what outrages me about the president being on vacation is the shelter in place order that came out early this morning. Um, well, I guess it was mid afternoon, early morning, mid morning in Afghanistan, the shelter in place order for all Americans and, you know, state department employees there in Kabul while the president is on vacation. Uh, there are Americans huddled American citizens, federal employees, public servants, huddled in fear in Afghanistan and uncertainty while the president has gone on vacation and is in the makeshift situation room at Camp David. Now, I know there was, there's always plenty of um, plenty of tar to throw at other presidents in the past who have been at Camp David during tense times, but uh, there's really no excuse for this. It's, it's unacceptable. It really makes me question his, his ability to lead or his staff's ability to advise him on exactly what's going on. There are American lives actually in danger right now. A um, lot going on in Kabul and outside of Kabul. Now, 
I can't wait for the books to come out uh, about this. Uh, journalism, I haven't seen a whole lot of journalism, you know, uh, reporters on the ground in Kabul, and for good reason. I've seen it, you know, I saw that picture, I'm sure, or that video, short video, I'm sure all you have, where it's a Taliban soldier down on his knees crying uh, for joy, uh, I guess, overtaking Kabul. I've uh, seen a few pictures coming out, a couple interviews uh, of the of the Taliban generals and emirs there. One, you know, I'll leave that for Josh. Uh, he, can, he can talk about that, the, the picture of the emirs and the little interview there. I think he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is just such an embarrassment for the administration. Like it or not, they own this. They completely own it. There, there is no, there's no getting around it. And what I'm seeing a lot of on social media is a false equivalence where people are saying what are, are, are calling this out for what a late term abortion it, it is. And then people are calling them out saying, well, do you want to come out of Afghanistan or not? Look, you can don't let anybody call you out on that. You can want to you can be on the side of we don't need troops in Afghanistan anymore and totally be calling out this situation and how it is. You don't want an outcome like this when we're when we're pulling out. It's it's too much. Uh, if I say I want, hey man, I really want to get rid of my car. I need to get rid of my car. That doesn't mean I drive it off a cliff and set it on fire. Okay, it means I sell it for the best price I can get for it and put myself in the best possible situation. So, you know, Josh, I, I, if you want to cover a little bit about you know what what's going on on the ground there, maybe some details we're leaving out. Um, in particular, those 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 Taliban generals and one in particular, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So the uh, so one of the tweets that came out uh, from when the Taliban took the uh, the presidential palace in Kabul. Um, again, the the guy's name made my colleague for something something like that. He's a mullah. Um, so he was a detainee at Guantanamo Bay for quite quite some time uh so if we if we go and get hop into the wayback machine and go back to the exchange for Bo Bergdahl under the Obama administration where we released five Taliban commanders uh from from Guantanamo for Bergdahl well I'm gonna go ahead and let you guess uh if this guy was one of those five or not you only get you only get one guess um yeah that's it so, but yeah, so the, the, again, the situation on the ground, and I mean, I think you even put, you know, you even uh, posted it. They took the presidential palace and the presidential palace is how, how many, like how many minutes away from the uh, U.S. embassy? Yeah, it's like a 10 minute drive, you know, from the presidential palace to the U.S. embassy. And I think if you go back and I have been, man, I've been on social media today, like, you know, like crazy, because again, I've, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of feelings um, about this, you go all the way back to, you know, July, um, even further when they're talking about, you know, what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. And you start reading, you know, the intelligence estimates of, out of the intelligence community, some of the intelligence estimates out of the intelligence community, and these are all published now, uh, so it's so it's open source said it would be a year to a year and a half before the Taliban could take Kabul. General Milley, chairman, the ch- chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was quoted as saying in July, and I quote, the Afghan security forces have the capacity to f- sufficiently fight and defend their country. They have proven that they're an effective fighting force that we do not see any issues with them being able to hold ground against the Taliban. Uh, so that didn't happen at all. The uh, Kunar province up in the northeast, uh, northeast Afghanistan uh, reports are saying that it was taken without one shot fired. Uh, an entire province, Taliban rolled in and told, told folks, you are Taliban now. And the folks responded, we're Taliban. And that was that. And they continued to press toward, toward Kabul. Uh, it's has been an absolute, you, you said it, this has been an absolute disaster. It's been an absolute 
Not only is it, you know, it's embarrassing for the administration, it's embarrassing for the United States. This is absolutely embarrassing. Our military is supposed to be the best in the world, and we're supposed to have trained these guys for 20 years, and here's what, you know, and then this is what it amounted to. This is just absolutely embarrassing. The fact that we can't get our citizens out in, a, you know, an orderly fashion is absolutely mind-boggling to me. And then you have Secretary of State Blinken in July. So here's a quote from Secretary of State. We are not withdrawing. We are staying. The embassy is staying. Our programs are staying. If there is a significant deterioration in security, I don't think it's going to be something that happens from a Friday to a Monday or very quickly. It literally happened overnight. Like you, I went to bed and it was, you know, Kandahar had fallen. Jalalabad had not fallen because I went to bed or before, way before you did because I go to bed at old man bedtime and, and you and Roger like to stay up and burn the midnight oil. Um, and you guys are all chatty Cathy uh, late at night. So, you know, you wake up and you're like, man, the, the embassy, they've taken the flag down at the embassy. Um, the embassy's closing. Man, that is not what Blinken said was going to happen. It's crazy. Uh, you know, when you when you look at how quick everything fell and everything came apart, it was absolutely it was absolutely insane. Uh, you know, there's a there's a video running around on, on Twitter of Biden sitting, you know, with Biden saying we will not have a situation to where you know there are helicopters lifting people out. Um, you know, in basically, you know, in, in, in chaos as we had in Saigon. And the next thing you know, there's literally a, you know, a CH-47, a Chinook, lifting people, lifting Americans out um, uh, of Kabul International, trying to get them to safety. Uh, so, and I don't know where those 47s are going. I mean, they, you know, they, they've got some range on them, but fully loaded, uh, you know, fully loaded, fully fueled, they, they can't go far. You know, they, they're not going to make, you know, they can't go flying over the, the Hindu Kush. Um, so, I don't know, man. It's, it is absolutely, absolutely insane because I remember, you know, when Trump questioned the intelligence community and when they come out with an assessment and Trump questioned them and people were like, how dare you? How dare you question the intelligence community? Well, folks, boys and girls, the same intelligence community just said it would take a year, year and a half to take Kabul. The Taliban took it in four days. How far, like how bad do you have to be at your job to get that wrong? Like where are you, you know, and it's something that some people are talking about, not many. Every, every ISAF commander for the last decade has lied has absolutely lied to the American people. They've lied to the president and they've lied to Congress on the readiness and the will of the Afghan National Army to stand and fight. They've lied. They flat out lied. And if there was ever a January 6th commission, there should be a damn Afghanistan commission. Like what happened? Well, I we spent trillions of taxpayer dollars there. We have had thousands of of Americans killed in Afghanistan. We've had tens of thousands wounded and we've had tens of thousands come back with, you know, invisible scars and people should not tolerate that. People should absolutely not tolerate that. Their money and their, you know, our most precious resource, America's sons and daughters gave their lives for that. And what did we get in return? We got a damn, an entire country's army that collapsed and, 96 hours like heads should roll there should be accountability for that I don't think there will be because I'm a pessimist by nature but it's just I don't know Luke I don't know what you think of that um, you know and just how you know the, the, the chairman of Joint Chiefs, you know, he, he's, he was so busy focused on, you know, understanding his white, you know, his white rage, um, you know, and, and critical race theory, you know, principles, you know, application and stuff that he just what did how did this get missed? And how did how, how did we get to how did we get to today? You know, with, with people on the runway at Kabul International, you know, scrambling to get out. Like how did I, I don't under I kind of understand how that happened, but I, I, I want your take. I've been rambling long <laughs> enough. 
Man, that's a big question, right? I mean, how did we get to where we are today? I, I mean, wow, that's that's the question, right? And you're just expecting me to answer it. You you far overestimate <laughs> me, my friend. You know, I think that I really, you know, I guess the countdown begins, right? Uh, the countdown begins uh, the moment the last troop, I guess, officially uh, leaves Afghan airspace on when we're going to get our monument. But I'm not even sure I want one now, man. It's um, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, we've had that conversation before. There's no monument to the longest war in U.S. history. So the countdown begins to that. But at this point, I'm not sure I want it. I want it. I'm I'm I think that Ken Burns or whoever has a real opportunity here uh, to cover uh, the longest war in American history because it's by it's bipartisan. I mean, you had uh, George W. Bush. Uh, for seven years, you had uh, Barack Obama for for eight. Yeah, Donald Trump for four, and you had Joe Biden for seven months. So I think that there's uh, plenty of blame to be cast all around. I do not lay the blame on one particular person, one particular administration. Uh, as, as that probably doesn't surprise anybody who knows me very well. Uh, I'm with Josh. I think that the the leadership and the and the planners have been lying to make themselves look good or to get that extra star or to set up their next uh, gig at Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. I, they, they've just been lying. You know, I, I, they've been lying to themselves. They've been lying to their, their boss, which is the president of the United States. And I have lost every bit of respect, uh, as, as you know, from the last, uh, you know, last time we talked about this, I've lost almost every shred of respect for every general, uh, that is every flag officer that has worked, uh, as a commander or on a staff in Afghanistan. And, um, it's up to them to win it back. Uh, I don't, I don't give a shit what anybody said. Well, Luke, you don't know what it's like to be a general. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to be a general, but, uh, 24 years in the DOD, I, I think I have an idea of what the buck stops with them, and it's their job to tell the truth to their commander in chief. And none of them did that. None of them. None of them. None of them. Uh, and if they did early on, well, then they were too stupid to understand where it was going and advise how things uh, were going to go. And, you know, I mean, you got three half wits here, midwits, who have been right on this shit way more than any. General officer, you know, granted, I was wrong on how long it would take. But granted, you know, I'm not a woke CIA analyst with access to every piece of of raw intelligence possible on the country of Afghanistan. I don't have all that. I don't have access to that. But I guarantee if I did or if Josh did or if Roger did and somebody would listen, we'd make a damn sight better call. And so would our audience than the calls that have been made over the past 20 years. There have been, you know, good times and bad times in Afghanistan, but how did we get to the point where we are today? Piss poor leadership, cowardice. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how else to how else to break it down. I mean, there's so many ways we went wrong in Afghanistan. You know, my take: we should have pulled out in 2005. I mean, or hey, how about this? We start the pullout in 2005. The pullout ends in 2010. How about that? You know, it's not the fact that Taliban was going to take over. You guys know what I think. Taliban was always going to take over when we left. It's the optics of this. It's the optics. We, we look like absolute bumbling fools, not only in the side of the world today, but in history, we will go down as freaking moron, idiot, jackasses who allowed who were there for 20 years and had every opportunity to leave it the right way or leave it in a way where we're not tucking our tails and running it's pathetic and i dude we were talking today if i was king of the world if i was king of the world and everybody had or king of the united states you know we went to a monarchy and, and I, I took i took uh i took the i took the throne 48 hours ago when this shit really started to go down, I, I definitely would have made better moves than have been being made. And, and why is that? Dude, first thing I would have done, just, just, just so the audience knows, and first of all, Josh and Roger would be on my staff. They would be high up on my staff. And I told, 
I told Josh that uh, if he screwed up, though, on my staff as a senior advisor to the king, I wouldn't kill him. I would publicly humiliate him. And I would uh, publicly humiliate him, Cersei Lannister, Gang of Throne, Game of Thrones style, walking down the street naked with, uh, with someone out in front of him, not a nun, someone out in front of him ringing the bell saying shame. And people throwing rocks and tomatoes and stuff like that at him. So, uh, and the person I would have out in front of him ringing the bell saying shame would be a worse punishment than death for Josh. We'll just leave it at that. But, you know, let, let's bounce, bounce this back and forth while I try to cool down a little bit, Josh. Um, so the first thing I would have done if I assumed the throne 48 hours ago is take a battalion or two of the 75th Ranger Regiment and seize the airport at, you know, the Hamid Karzai International Airport. I would seize it, and uh, close on their heels would be the entirety of the green cycle of the 82nd Airborne, and uh, we would just go from there. That that would be the first order, and technically they should all that should all be done within 24 hours. That would be the first step. And I know that, that a lot of people and a lot of military experts out there will, will, will try to argue with me right now and say, well, we kind of did do that. You know, we, we did put some people in there, you know, and there's 6,000 troops on their way. But well, for fucking what? And we don't know because the president's not telling us and neither is anybody else. Where's Jen Psaki? Hashtag where's Biden? Ugh. It's it's. Okay, Josh, what would you have done? Okay, let's say I think you agreed with me on seizing the airfield. Okay, we've seized the airfield, and the 82nd Airborne is dropping basically onto the airfield. I'm sure there's a drop zone somewhere in there. And uh, what's the next step? So that was 24 hours ago. Uh, uh, Now you're at uh, just before they took Jalalabad. So now what? So I would re- I, so let's rewind it a little bit before because if I'm going to conduct a, a non-combatant evacuation operation out of Kabul, I'm not using Hamid Karzai International Airport. That airport is too soft. The defenses are way too soft. I would have never turned over responsibility of Bagram. Right, Bagram's a harder target. Uh, we could we had you know a lot more folks there than we do Hamid uh, Hamid Karzai International. I would have taken, you know, I mean, granted, it was, you know, for a C-130, it would have been like a four-minute flight uh, from Harbin Karzai to, uh, you know, to Bagram. But I would have had every single rotor wing aircraft uh, there, you know, getting Americans out of Kabul over to Bagram. And then there would have been a fleet of C-17s there that would have been taking off around the clock, getting our folks out. Uh, but I would have done the same thing, you know, as you, as far as the Rangers, uh, two battalions of Rangers. To, uh, to to lock that place down, and then I would say you know the the ready brigade out of uh, out of the 82nd to secure you know even more on the outside the perimeter of that thing, and it would have been like it would have been straight like Mongol horde. There would have been a 360 degree perimeter, and it would have basically been you know you are a blocking position, and you know you go back and you take a look at what a blocking position is. Okay, I'm going to set here. I'm going to this is my blocking position, and anything that comes within you know range of my weapons, I kill it. And so, and it would have been flat out. There would have been commando solo right out there playing. Don't come here. Don't approach it. Anybody. But it, you know, unless you're you know unless we've already approved, and you know we, we're getting you out. Sorry, man, but that, that's just not going to happen. That's what that's what I would have done. And then after that, man, it's just uh, it's you know it's a bound back, and um, you know we're flying we're flying guys out. But okay, so th- this is where if I you know if I'm king, you know, and you're already messing up, you're already on the verge of uh, of the shame of the shame little walk of shame <laughs> because you're, your now, you're, now you're question, now you're questioning the king because. Josh, I was only king 48 hours ago, and and now you're saying, well, you should have been king like two weeks ago when we uh, <laughs> when we left Bagram in the dead of night. So, but, but look, look, here's the thing, you know, and we'll get back to like the plan and stuff. But uh, Josh, Josh mentioned the speed of this thing, and the speed. Um, I, I, again, as I said, I, I failed to take into account a couple of things because I am a bit still there is a little bit of an idealist bone 
in my body that I think is now completely gone. And that idealist bone will cloud my judgment sometimes. And the speed of this thing was just, um, I, I underestimated two things. I already said the first one was, I thought that they would. I thought the DOD would be able to convince the Biden administration to, under the table, slow down the withdrawal. You know, officially troops are out, but we have the U.S. forces, uh, uh, Afghanistan, whatever the the, the two star command or three star command. They stood up in Qatar. I think. I, I thought it would just be slower. Okay, so so number one, number two, I overestimated the Afghan uh, National Army, which. I was really wasn't giving them much anyway. The Afghan National Army, the Afghan police, the national police, and the Afghan people. I am going to stop short of telling you what I think about the vast majority of the Afghan people at this moment, uh, because the Taliban simply cannot take that much ground without, and I'll reiterate Josh's point, without an emissary or two or three coming to, you know, the state capital, if you will, the provincial capital building, talking to the mayor and his people, or the governor and his mayor or his people, and saying, "Look, um, you've got a choice. You're you're with us, or your entire family's dead, and we're going to burn this place to the ground." And they all said, "Yep, yep." Like Josh said, "We're Taliban now." That's how they did it. That's how they did it, people. There was some fighting, but basically everyone just gave up and. You know, I, I'm not going to cast blame. I know there's context to that. I know that there's, you know, everyone has their own lives. But um, Taliban had this planned out for a long time. And look, so back to me being king. Um, when I take the airfield, though, Josh, it's not just going to be for a neo. We're going to get our people there uh, that are in Kabul. And we're going to get them out. To a point, we're going to leave the ambassador there, and we're going to set up a temporary embassy at the uh, or consulate at the uh, at the airport, and manned by an ambassador. Ambassador's not leaving. You're staying, Joker. You're not going anywhere because we're not quite done yet. We're going to make one final statement, and that statement's going to last about six months. And uh, you know, we've got our blocking force there. We've got we we seize the airfield. Now we're going to transition to a different type of operation, and it's going to be reminiscent of what I witnessed in uh, northern Iraq and Syria, circa 2016. It's or Iraq just before the SOFA was signed. It's going to be scorched earth, man. It's going to be scorched earth. And we're going to see, we're going to be like, you guys move too fast. You move too fast. It made us feel uncomfortable. We're still leaving, but a lot of you are going to be leaving this planet before we do. I'd be making a statement a la, you know, uh, Sherman's March to the Sea, all that stuff. The statement is, you do not mess with us. You move too fast. You made us feel uncomfortable. And this is just a taste of what we'll do if we have to come back. And that's important, in my opinion. As jo- and I'm going to give it right back to Josh because now I'm talking too much. That's important because in, 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 the, in the mind of your average Afghan, in the mind of your average Iraqi, I won't speak to Persians, but Afghans, Iraqis, uh, Syrians, this is a very symbolic thing that we're tucking our tails and running. They have won. It didn't, doesn't matter how many of them died. It doesn't, Somali, Somalis are the same way. It doesn't matter of how many of them died. It doesn't matter how long it took. They won and we're weak. They won and we're weak. That's how they see it. And they will get more aggressive. And this is absolutely not a good thing. Am I right or wrong, Josh? I mean, that's what I've seen over the years. You're a hundred percent right. Uh, you know, these are when it comes to you know when it comes to organizations like the Taliban, even ISIS, you know, Al Qaeda, uh, AQIM, who you know name your name your Islamic terrorist group. You know, one of the things that they do respect is force and brutality. They they you know they they'll they'll respect that. They'll respect somebody who stays and fights. Um, they, they, they definitely do not respect, you know, the, the kowtowing and the, and the running, uh, 
you know, the, the disorganized retreat. Um, but, you know, I was just up at Little Bighorn Battlefield. And, you know, you, you, if anybody who's ever been there, you see what happens in a disorganized retreat. There's headstones everywhere, and they're just scattered. They're just pell-mell all over that battlefield for miles, um, you know, because there was a disorganized retreat. Uh, and, you know, under under fire. And it was just it, it, it ended very badly. And so and that's what you have right now. Um, yeah. No, I think, you know, you leave it there. You leave it there for six months. You know, you, you do send that message. Hey, we are uh, you know, we are not running. Um, and that was one thing I was kind of waiting on. I was kind of waiting on that when, you know, especially after after Kandahar fell and you had these big convoys coming up Highway 1 of straight Taliban. And, you know, it was reminiscent of the, uh, you know, the ISIS convoys back in 2014 coming out of Syria, you know, when they came across the border into northern Iraq. You know, it's like, hey, man, these things are two and three miles long. They're not even like they're not trying to hide. It's, you know. I mean, granted, in Afghanistan, it's all our, you know, Humvees that we gave the Afghan National Army vice all the Toyota Hiluxes that, uh, you know, that ISIS was using. But it was the same thing. And I was waiting. I was like, hey, they're like they're on the highway. Like, that's perfect. But it's it would not be that hard. Just, you know, you put a couple of JDAMs, you know, down there and you stop them. You let them know, hey, not yet. Not yet. Let us get our people out. And and then once we're done, then but not yet. Um and I think, you know, you bring up a great point. Uh, and that lets th- – not only does that let them know, hey, we're not done, but that lets the world know, hey, when the Americans say they're going to do something, they're going to do it, but don't don't F with them because, you know, at the end of the day, it's good. You know, you're going to go – you're going to go meet your maker. I <sighs> – I don't know, but there's no way to undo this, right? It's it's done, and I think it's it's a complete. It, it is an absolute national disgrace, um, and so you know, looking at social media, there's a lot of you know, there, uh, you know, like you said, there's a lot of blame going around. And there's a lot of people who 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 definitely are going to get their you know their share, but I'll I will. I will touch on the Afghan people, um, at least a certain popu- segment of their population real quick. Um, I've heard, you know, there was a protest outside of the White House today from, you know, a lot of Americans of Afghani uh, ethnicity and then some, you know, Afghan nationals who, who are here in the States saying that America abandoned them, that we abandoned them. Um, and here's what I'm going to say to that. If you are a military age male in Afghanistan and you did not pick up a weapon and stand opposed and fight the Taliban and stand up against the Taliban, honestly, you can kiss my ass. We didn't abandon anybody. You abandoned your country. You pick up a weapon and you fight. We should not have to come over there and fight your wars. We can't want your freedom and your safety more than you. All right, that's not how this works. We sacrificed enough. You have to sacrifice some for your own freedom and safety, you know, you, you, you have to undergo the toils of, you know, maintaining that, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, what Thomas Paine said, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, everybody wants freedom, but nobody wants to pay the price. Nobody wants to undergo the burden uh, of ensuring that. So I'll say that to the military age males in Afghanistan, and I'll say that to the military age males who are standing on the tarmac at Hamid Karzai International right now, begging for the United States to get them out. Maybe if you would have stood and fought instead of throwing down your weapons and taking you off your uniform, maybe you wouldn't be in that situation you're in right now. So I feel bad for the women and children uh, because they are about to go back to, you know, you mentioned it before. Hey, man, that stadium's getting opened back up. The, the Coliseum's getting opened back up. Uh, and there's going to be there's going to be some uh, some examples made out of folks inside that, and and that's tragic. Uh, you know, as it's uh, it sucks. You know, it sucks watching this. It sucks. You know, knowing how much time we spent there, knowing that you know we left friends there, um, and knowing that the entire world is watching the United States right now, and. Our president hasn't come out and said anything. It has not addressed anything. Like, that is insane to me. He hadn't come out. The vice president hasn't come out. The White House press secretary hasn't come out. You had the secretary of state come out really quick. 
and say, hey, this isn't going to be like Saigon, immediately followed by videos that look just like Saigon, you know, in 75. And so, but, dude, not even not even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has come out, you know, saying, hey, our military has it under control. They're getting U.S. citizens out, you know, like nothing. It is it is comms blackout. And it is like, what is going on? And there is no direction there's no absolutely no national leadership come out and on the news right now and saying hey it's going to be fun this is what we're doing it's not you know just bear with us you know we're getting americans out there's a lot of americans that are trapped on a runway in afghanistan the taliban are literally you i don't know if you saw the video that i posted but guys are trying to get people loaded on a c-17 and there's tracers Right. You can look, you see tracers coming over the aircraft and you're like, what is going on? Why is the national leadership, the elected leaders that people elected, not addressing the nation, not saying, hey, this is what we're doing. Like we're getting out like I'm old and retired and, you know, I put on a few pounds, man. But, dude, if if I could, honestly, I would go over there right now. Like I would go over there right now and do what I could to help every American get get out of there. That place is not worth another American life. It just, like, but I, it, it's it, it's killing it's killing oh my soul, God. and it's make, it's making me angry. The more and more I think about it, the more, the, the more pissed I'm getting. Um, well, we're good. just a couple of we're just a couple of Joes, and right? we're making jokes about being king for a day. But I mean, here's what I expect in a situation like this, and I believe Josh and Roger do too. It's uh, every hour, man. Every, every hour we're having an official you know press briefing at the very least you got the white house press secretary up there uh giving an hourly update on the americans and those afghans that that helped us out over the years getting out of afghanistan with tracer rounds going over the freaking aircraft it's crazy so did we we called it on blinken we called it on blinken biggest out of his own mouth the biggest mistake that barack obama made was what Blinken encouraged him to do with respect to to uh, Libya. And, dude, th- this is just not a surprise. It's not a surprise at all. It's like you don't think... I mean, you want to believe that maybe he's learned something. Maybe he's learned something. He's not going to screw it up like as bad as he did before, but here we are, my friends. It's like Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan. Let me let, me let you behind the curtain a little bit, folks. If you're the president of a country who is, you're going to flee and set up a government in exile in a foreign country, you don't just decide to do that one morning. You plan that with the, with, 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 with the country you're going to. You plan it months in advance. Months in advance. He knew that this was how it was going to go down. You don't just take off in a plane and on the way say, hey, uh, uh, air control Tajikistan, uh, you mind if we land and I'm going to take uh, refuge in your country? No, 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 no. That is not how this works. And the fact that the fucking State Department, maybe they do know about it and they're just, they're just, put, well, I doubt it. I doubt the State Department does. But maybe some of those other three letter agencies knew that this was coming as well as Ghani did. And they just pulled the wool over our eyes and decided that they were going to shock us so much. It was going to happen so fast that we forget about it by next week. People knew that this was coming. At an, at an official level, at least Ashraf Ghani knew it was coming. He knew he had the plan. They dropped the ball. Of course, State Department. I mean, my God. Ashraf Ghani has been planning this with Tajikistan and probably some other countries, too. He's probably reached out to him. But we didn't plan. I mean, it, it, you know, you look at Blinken making these comments. He obviously didn't know. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said what he did, what Josh just said. You know, uh, this is not going to be like psych. I mean, come on, man incompetence incompetence I, I i can't even get my thoughts logically out maybe we shouldn't have recorded because i'm just i'm not i got too much to say you know so i'll, I'll back it off i'll back it off back it off um i'll ask josh a couple of things um first of all he i'm gonna throw a question back to him um as far as with the same magnitude, he threw the question at me of how did we get to this? It's like, fuck it, man, I'm supposed to give you a Ken Burns documentary, you know, six part, three hour (laughs) documentary each on uh, how we got to this. Bam. Okay. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, (laughs) so my, my question and I'll, uh, I'll kick it to you in a second is, okay, so what next, what, what happens now? 
and I know I'm putting you on the spot because we we do make a lot of predictions here, and we try to be, you know, we try to we try to put some thought into our predictions. So what what happens next, you know, and how will this possibly be spun? I mean, I'll cover that one a little bit. You cover what next and how is it going to be spun and what the narrative is going to be. But I just again, the Biden administration can blame Trump. They can blame George W. Bush all all they want. They can even blame Obama, but they own this. Uh, they changed a lot of plans. They changed a lot of agreements that Trump signed in. They changed those the first the first week with all those executive orders. They changed the Keystone Pipeline uh, stuff. They changed the border policy. Uh, they're talking about changing the JCPOA with Iran. Why didn't they change this? So one of two things. Either your advisors and your judgment sucks and you thought this was a good plan and now you're just blaming it, blaming Trump, Trump administration because it turned out not to be a good plan. Or what's the alternative? You decided not to change it. No, we go to shit like this. Either way, you suck at your job. So I think the narrative, if they can possibly, possibly salvage it, uh, the media, that is. Uh, that that's basically the uh, propaganda arm of the D- Democratic National Committee. The 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 narrative is going to be something along the lines of you know well, Taliban's not that bad. Could be worse. You know the the Afghan people suffered during the you know U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. You know opium, uh, this and that. But now at least. You know, they don't have to pay taxes. You know, now there's a little card where they don't have to pay taxes at every uh, at, at every border checkpoint or every every, uh, you know, provincial checkpoint. You know, so maybe the Taliban's not that bad. You know, I think that there'll be somewhat of a media blackout on the massacres that are happening, the hangings and the beheadings and the uh, mutilations that are going to happen uh, at the stadium, like Josh said. Uh, I think I, I don't know about media blackout. I mean, there may not be any journalists there who have the courage uh, to cover it, and the Taliban will definitely uh, not want that covered. Um, although they do sometimes use it for their own propaganda, so I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of coverage of of the massacres that are going to happen. Uh, a lot more women in burqas. You're not going to see as much coverage. What you are going to hear about is how the Taliban ain't that bad. Maybe this was the best thing. So, Josh. Um, I'm going to make a, I don't know, I, I'll, leave, I'll leave some stuff to myself. We can cover it on few future episodes. But um, so what next, if you can boil that down and you want, if you want to cover how, if it's even possible to spin this in any type of pos, po, positive way. So I, yeah, I don't know how you spin this. I, tr- I truly don't in a way that makes any, any level of sense. Um, as far as, you know, why did they not change the plan if it was so bad or did they change the plan, you know, and it was so bad, they changed all the others. You know, I mean, I go back to, uh, you know, I go back to Bob Gates, you know, making the comment, Joe Biden has been wrong on every major foreign policy decision for the last 40 years. And this is just go ahead and, you know, put put this neck, you know, this is just the next feather in that in that cap uh, for for Joe Biden being wrong. Um, I don't uh, I know they changed some of the uh, you know, some of the plan. Uh, you know, Trump did say, hey, look, it's time to come out of Afghanistan. He said that back in 2017. Congress stopped him. Congress stonewalled him. Congress said no. You know, so we had an opportunity to leave then and leave in an orderly fashion. We chose, you know, Congress chose not to. Um, the plan, they came in, they, you know, like I said, I don't know, they looked at it and was like, yeah, it's good. Or, you know, no, we, we, we want to do this. And it just goes back to Joe Biden being wrong on every major foreign policy decision for the last 40 years. Uh, what next? So it'll be really interesting to see what this Taliban uh, regime does differently than than the last one. So a lot of the leadership, you know, from the last one, obviously, are, you know, we killed uh, quite a few of those. You know, Mullah, Mullah Omar is not uh, not part of this. But I think what you're going to see in the first, and let's go, let's say the first six to 12 months, uh, you're going to see the Taliban move to gain legitimacy in the world and be recognized. China has already said they will recognize the uh, the Taliban regime uh, that, you know, if they if they take power. Uh, I would look for, you know, the the Chinese to court the Taliban, uh, 
Afghanistan is sitting on approximately $3 trillion worth of rare earth minerals. Obviously, China is, you know, spanning the globe looking for those and, and wants those. Uh, so I would look for China to, you know, come in and either, you know, pay the Taliban outright or, you know, hey, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go and we'll repave all, you know, Highway 1 or <laughs> where you guys put all the, you know, holes in it from IEDs or whatever. Uh, but I would expect to see China court, uh, court the Taliban quite heavy uh, to get at those rare earth minerals. We'll see how that goes. Generally speaking, um, as long as China doesn't put troops in there and it's just folks coming in digging, you know, digging holes, I think it'd be okay. I think China tries to exert any level of control militarily in there. I think it's going to go all bad for them and they're just going to wind up on the, you know, on on the same board that uh, that us and the Mongols and uh, Alexander the Great are. Uh, the Afghan, you know, Afghanistan will have it. So I think that's what you're going to see. Russia has said that they are not closing their embassy in Kabul. They will leave their embassy open and it will continue normal operations. So I think you're going to see the Taliban possibly try and establish some, you know, sort of legitimacy with Russia. The Russia will probably recognize them. But I think that's what you're going to see in the next six to 12 months. The Taliban know and the world knows that the United States administration is weak. Um, I would look to, you know, see these. I want to say, you know, maybe maybe they're a little bit more modern, modernized than the, you know, the previous Taliban regime. If you could be more modern than, you know, Bronze Age Islamic ideology, uh, as modern as that can be, you know, you're going to have, there's no, you know, there's already going to be no music. Uh, you know, women are going back to blue burqas, um, you know, in the blue ninja suits. Uh, that's going to be, it. you know, all the males are going to have beards. And I think we're, I think those are going to be, uh, you know, I think, I think that's all a given. Um, but as far as what next, I think you're going to see the Taliban try and step out a little more on the world stage and uh, and try and gain some legitimacy. They do have some problems that they're going to have to deal with in regards to ISIS. Uh, ISIS K is you know they want a place in Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban do not want them there. They obviously are ideologically opposed. Um, but I think you're and I think you're going to see some other countries, possibly, you know, maybe Iran, uh, you know, try and normalize relations with uh, with the Taliban. They already have Iraq on their border. That's, you know, somewhat unstabilized. They don't want another unstabilized country on their border that they've had for the last 20 years, you know, with us right next door on, on both sides. So I think they may move in to uh, kind of normalize, at least on the western side of Afghanistan around Herat. Uh, and those traditionally, you know, where you, are, you got that Persian spill over there anyway. So I kind of think that's what's next, at least the next six to 12 months for uh, for Afghanistan and the Taliban. We can come back and check the game tape uh, to see if I was right or if I was completely wrong and uh, and off base. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I'm going to give it back to Luke and, uh, and and he can he can you know give you his final thoughts and, and close this out. Um a lot of folks, I, you know, I've gotten, I've sent messages and texts and stuff back and forth with a lot of folks that uh, that have served in Afghanistan. A lot of folks I served with and stuff, and there's a lot of people who are uh, not, they're not in a good place right now. Um, you know, this is gut wrenching to watch. Uh, you know, when when you have been there and you fought and you bled and you and you cried, and so I want you to know that you guys did your job. Uh, you did not fail. You know, we went over there to bring 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 to justice or bring justice to the folks who you know committed 9/11 and to the folks who provided them the operational time and space to do do that uh, and to prevent another major attack on the homeland well we've done that there's not been another 9/11 of you know scale event in the United States on US soil since then so I want you to know you guys did your job uh, and you should be proud. You should be proud of your service. You should be proud of your time and your efforts in Afghanistan. And don't let anybody ever, ever take that away from you. Uh, it's just, you know, hold, hold your head high. Um, you know, people are going to armchair quarterback this thing until, you know, for, forever. Uh, and so don't ever think that, uh, you know, that you that you fail short, that you caused this. Um, and hopefully folks will hold those accountable who do share the blame, uh, you know, the next time they roll to the ballot box. Uh, I'm not hopeful, but 
I just wanted to get uh, I just wanted to get that out for uh, you know for those folks who are kind of in the in the fields um, you know over the last couple of weeks watching this and are going to be in the fields over the next couple of months watching you know the the fallout from this because there's going to be some there's going to be some significant fallout and there's going to be some very good people in Afghanistan that are going to lose their life for uh, you know for for the support and the help that they that they gave us and that's a damn shame. Um, so, Luke, I'll give it back over to you, um, and uh, you can give us your thoughts and uh, and, and close us out. Uh, I was reminded um, as Josh was talking of uh, you know to it's you know uh, everyone who served in Afghanistan below the rank of O six or yeah below the rank O six or below, um, you know you did a good job and all that stuff. I was reminded, uh, and I'll take a little bit different tack than than Josh took. When Josh was saying that, I, I was reminded of the dramatic conclusion scene in Goodwill Hunting when Robin Williams takes poor Matt Damon's face into his hands and says, It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And Matt Damon cries and it's all emotional. Now, that's it, it, true. It, it's, not, it's not your fault. But you're angry and you're angry like us. You're frustrated like us and you're wondering what the hell and it boils down to kind of what Josh says is, is accountability. And it's, it's not your accountability. It was your senior, senior, senior leaders and representatives accountability. And I'll pull out another quote from Red Dawn, old Jed Eckert, you know, uh, consoling, uh, who was it? Uh, C. Thomas Howell, I think it was, saying, let it turn to something else. And C. Thomas Howell is crying. He's like, don't cry. Don't be sad. Let it turn to something else. Let it turn, let it turn, and see Thomas Howell became a badass. And what I'm saying is, man, hold 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 the leaders accountable, man. Make moves. Get involved in, in your community. Make culture and let them know. You know, I, the reason my, my stuff froze up is because I was lo- trying to look up uh, uh, the quote of beware the anger of the legions. You know, if, if you let our uh, bones lay here dead upon these dry sands, for no purpose, beware the anger of the legions. And there are over a million of us who have served there who are pissed off, angry. And don't get down about it. Don't be mad about it. You can be mad about it, but don't, don't be sitting there belly gazing. You know, hold the leaders accountable. I mean, I'm, I don't know how to tell you to do that. There's probably a million different ways. You know, get involved civically. Let's make sure this doesn't happen again. You know, petition your representative for a contingency or a war tax. Next time we go into Afghanistan, time we go into Iraq or Syria, let's write some legislation that says across the board, every single taxpayer and corporation will now pay a 1% war tax or contingency tax so that everybody's got skin in the game, not the million of us and our families, probably 3 million who have suffered, God forbid, lost someone, lost a limb, lost eyesight, altered your life forever. We're the ones with skin in the game, no one else. So, you know, American people, why not, you know, who, who didn't serve, who didn't have any skin in the game? Think about this real hard, man. Demand a contingency tax. Get some skin in the game beyond a yellow ribbon sticker, we support the troops, which went away real fast. When's the last time a care package sent? From Jane Sixpack, who was real good from 2001 to 2006. And he just fucking disappeared while the rest of us were still down there sucking up the bad decisions that our representatives, senior military leaders, and commanders in chief were making all along the way. So look, obviously I'm still pissed. But I'll tell you, watch out for, you know, Twitter, Facebook, moderating content. Jack Posobiec is all over this today. I highly recommend you follow him on Twitter. Um, he's all over it. He's uh, breaking a lot of news. He has a lot of insiders. And I was just looking at, at, at his feed, and there was a sensitive image warning. So I was like, what's this sensitive image? Because the tweet was 80 second all the way. So I open up the sensitive image, and all it is is three 80-second airborne soldiers standing in the dark at Bagram. How's that, how's that a sensitive image? I don't understand. So the content moderation and the um, censorship has already begun. 
Social media uh, giants are going to spin this for the administration. I shouldn't even say for the administration, for the power brokers and the establishment in Washington, D.C. Jack Posobiec brought up another good point. Not a, There aren't many representatives or senators out there, let alone the commander-in-chief, President of the United States, uh, and his staff making public appearances today. And Sunday's usually the day for that. They're hiding because they know that this is embarrassing and we're pissed. I'll just say, don't forget about it, man, and encourage people not to forget about it. That's about it. I I hope that this uh, recording turns out. Um, I hope you stuck with us. Uh, Josh and I apologize for uh, the lack of editing. Uh, Just Roger's just not going to have time before we, uh, or I'm sorry, not Roger, but our our sound editor's not going to have time to to make it perfect before we, we let it out. So, Thanks for sticking with us. Please give us your uh, feedback on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, If you must message us individually, go ahead. But we'd much prefer you show your thoughts to the entire audience as well. Talking to you, Ryan. (laughs) Both Ryans, actually. You know who you are. So anyway, you guys uh, really uh, give some good thoughts. Hunter, too. Um... So put them out there for everyone to see so that we all know that there's others out there that think like the rest of us. And um, thanks to Carlton Zeus. Until next time, keep your canteen cups full and tightly secured.